Welcome everybody to the Keto Edge Summit, where we are dispelling the myths, helping you overcome the hurdles, and empowering you to improve your brain and your body through the ketogenic lifestyle. I'm your host, Dr. David Jockers. I'm really excited about today's interview because we're going to be talking with a research expert and somebody that really that has been studying how to measure ketosis, nutritional ketosis, uh, for a long time now and has published different studies associated with that. We're going to really dive into that topic in detail. So I want to welcome my guest. This is Dr. Joe Anderson. Dr. Joe, great to have you on today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to have this conversation. Yeah, for sure. And so Dr. Joe is one of the few breath science leaders in the world. He's bringing deep experience in pulmonary physiology and breath research science to our Keto Edge Summit. He's the owner of Anderson Bioscience is an affiliate faculty member in the bioengineering department at the University of Washington, where he also obtained his PhD in chemical engineering. He's published over 40 peer-reviewed publications. So that's quite uh, you know, a, a, a number of studies to, to publish and quite a background that he has. Joe led the development of breath protocols, performed clinical trials, and structured science and physiology goals for the development of a cutting edge breath ketone analyzer called The Level, and we're gonna talk about that in today's interview. Joe is responsible for taking the research he performs and helping Level, the company Level, translate that into protocols to help improve individuals' metabolic and fat-burning state. Joe's strategic vision and deep expertise have been an immense driver in Level's success. And so, Dr. Joe, great to have you on. I really wanted to bring you on because, you know, we wanted to dive into this topic of really how to understand measurement of breath acetone, ketosis, and really how people can track how they're burning fat. I think that's a really important topic that we're going to dive into uh, in today's interview. But first, tell us your story, how you really got into pulmonary physiology and uh, this sort of science. Yeah, to try to keep it quick, uh, my background was in chemical engineering, and I went to graduate school to get a degree that would have some biology component in it. So the gentleman I worked with had actually invented the home kidney dialysis machine back in the late 60s. Um, and he was, he was so successful, he was actually um, nominated for a Nobel Prize from that research. But he had a great relationship with the medical school and his project that he was working on when I was entering graduate school was on how do chemicals move in the lungs and come out in the exhaled breath. And really what the goal of the project they were on was using mathematical analysis to understand that. So that's kind of where it started. And then I moved into a lot of experimental stuff with those groups. And then over the course of uh, multiple different research fellowships and faculty positions um, have continued to do that work. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's fascinating work. That's for sure. And how does the ketogenic diet and lifestyle really impact the gases in our breath? Let's talk about that. Sure. So the, the ketogenic lifestyle, essentially what we're talking about there is moving from burning mostly sugars to burning fats. So that conversion from sugars to fats means that some, some things have to happen in your body. And one of those is you have to generate fuel for your brain. Your brain re typically reliant on carbohydrates for fuel, but when those get shut off or restricted, then fats need to fuel that brain, but the fats can't uh, be used as fuel for the brain. So what happens in the body is the body will convert some of those fats to chemicals that can be used for brain fuel, which are these ketone bodies. It happens in the liver. The mother, the mother chemical is called acetoacetate that gets converted. And then that gets broken down into two other chemicals. One is beta hydroxybutyrate. Uh, and then both those acetoacetate and beta hydroxybutyrate remain in the blood or the, li or the liquids of the body. Um, acetoacetate also gets converted into acetone, which is small, and that comes out in the exhaled breath. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about these uh, ketone bodies. Mm. When we're talking about ketosis is chemicals that can be used for brain fuel that then mm. appear to un help us understand how much fat we're metabolizing. Right, absolutely. So you mentioned basically three, the three major ketones, which are acetic acid, uh, acetoacetate, I should say, and acetone and beta-hydroxybutyrate. And so when it comes to measurement of ketones, who most people are, are familiar, at least most people talk about blood ketones as a major measurement with beta-hydroxybutyrate. And so your science has really looked into measuring acetone, which you know, is less invasive because you don't have a blood draw. We'll, we'll dive into that in more detail. Um, but that's really what you focused on to measure out the fat burning state. 
And so when we talk about the ketogenic lifestyle, what kind of conditions um, can be impacted by ketosis? Well, in terms of, so, so let me make sure what, what medical conditions can yeah. you use ketosis to kind of resolve those conditions or help yeah. improve those conditions? Sure. Um, there's, there's, a, there's quite a few. I mean, the first one that came up was really epilepsy. And this is mm. probably almost 100 years ago, they realized getting people off sugar and starting to put them on a higher fat diet could reduce the epileptic events, the seizures, and the, the recession of those, or um, re refractory is what they call it, can be almost um, 80%, I believe, in wow. terms of people having um, episodes. So it's pretty effective in that, and particularly for children. So that was the first place where they found it to be effective. They kind of, in some sense, ditched it in the 70s and 80s when we thought fat was bad, but they've, they, we've come back to it really with some vigor recently. The other ones are, for example, type 2 diabetes. A lot of people think type 2 diabetes can be called sugar diabetes, right? Because sugar is causing that problem. So there's a company even now that's really working on um, a large-scale rollout of, of putting people on ketogenic diets to, re to reverse type 2 diabetes, and they're having success when people are compliant. When people say, yes, I'm going to get off sugar and I'm going to elevate my ketone bodies, that can, be, that can work. Um, other ones are such as cancer, and we can go into some detail, all sorts of different cancers. Some are more effective or more um, sensitive to the ketosis than others. Uh, brain issues, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, just simple dementia, and then as well as just metabolic disease. So, for example, if you have some sort of metabolic issue that you think is caused by sugar or maybe your metabolism, your chain of metabolism, there's a defect in that. You can sometimes overcome that with ketosis as well. All these, a lot of times, for example, cancer, you use ketosis in combination with the current state of, of medical um, treatment, which would be chemotherapy. So the two together, a lot of times, have a better outcome than just one by itself. Yeah, so it's an adjunctive therapy, kind of a foundational technique there. And you know what's cool about this summit is we've got experts in all those areas. We've got a cardiologist talking about using a ketogenic lifestyle to help impact heart disease. We've got a diabetes expert talking about how to use it for diabetes. We've got cancer experts and researchers talking about how to use it for cancer. So, you know, really every chronic inflammatory condition, we can use this sort of a foundational lifestyle to help improve. And that's what's really, really exciting. And so let's, uh, let's go back into measuring ketones. And so what are the major ways that, uh, that people can measure their state of ketosis? Yeah, and you know, one of the things, if I can just take one step back, the question in between these two is you have these conditions where you know ketosis can be beneficial, and then the question that you typically will have is, well, how much do I need to have, right? Mm, what is yeah. what we call the therapeutic dose? Right. So you get to the point, before we go to how to measure them, you get to the point, of, I got to measure them because it's not like a pill I take, or take a 50 you know, milligram tablet and I'm on my way, everyone's body, how they process those macronutrients, you know, the sugars, the proteins, et cetera, are going to be different. So the level of ketosis is going to be different. So that's, mm -hmm. you know, if you're trying to take it for a cancer therapeutic, you're going to say, I've got to exceed a certain threshold for me to get that benefit. Or if I'm going to take it for type 2 diabetes reversal, what threshold do I have to get to? How do I get there? How is my body responding to this, et cetera? Mm -hmm. so, so that's kind of the motivation to say, you know, there is a, there is a place – a really good place for measuring um, ketone bodies in your in your breath, in your blood, et cetera. And so to get to your, your question is there are different ways to measure them. The, the classic way is to measure acetoacetate in the urine. And I bring that up because really that's probably the poorest way by far. Yeah. And there's a couple reasons for that. Number one, your state of hydration is really important, right? If you're, if you're dehydrated, the concentration is going to be higher etc. If you've just urinated recently, it's hard to take hard to urinate again because it's coming out in your urine. So it depends on when you need to go to the bathroom, so to speak. Privacy is obviously an issue because you're going to be doing it behind closed walls. But probably the biggest one is this simply the measurement that it provides is color coded. So there's no quantitative mean it's not providing you a value. And so it's hard to kind of track and trend and really understand what's going on. So you move from that to blood beta hydroxybutyrate which is the really at this point is somewhat the gold standard because we've been using it for so long. Um, and that's a nice measurement because you can get a quant quantitative value, right? And so you can get a number that you take. However, the, the, the drawbacks of it are, and you already mentioned it, you get to poke your finger. And at first, at first blush, you may say, well, I'm just pricking my finger. It's not a big deal. 
but we've done quite a few of these and you get bruised pretty fast, um, which is, which is disappointing. And then the other thing that's disappointing is the cost of those strips are fairly expensive. And so, you know, if you mess up a measurement, which happens periodically, you get to pay for that cost and it can be, you know, three bucks a strip, four bucks a strip. So it's not uh, insignificant. And then the other thing that's interesting too, is there's no really device that allows you to easily track and trend those measurements, which can be um, somewhat difficult as well. Mm. So yeah. the final one is the one we're working on is breath acetone. And that's with the, the level device. I could certainly go through that as well. Yeah. We want to know, I mean, for me personally, I've been tracking ketones for a long time and I freak out every single time I'm trying to do a blood draw, right? My stress hormones go up. It's, it's a stressful event for me. And so I'm like, you know, part of the ketogenic lifestyle is minimizing unnecessary stress. So for some individuals, it's probably not that big a deal. Um, but for other individuals, it really is a big deal when we try to try to prick our finger. And so that's where, you know, coming in with some sort of non-invasive, effective way, because again, like you said, you're in ketones, you know, as your body gets more keto adapted, you're going to, you're going to produce less of the acetoacetate. So um, it's not a good measurement. It's not really a good measurement of how your body's using ketones for sure. It really just tells you if you're producing them or not. So we had to find, you know, something else. And so let's talk about breath acetate levels. Yeah. So the, the breath, breath acetone is nice, obviously, because you can provide it with any breath, any breath that you can make back to back measurements um, as you're breathing in some sense. And so uh, very, fairly non-invasive. Um, we do provide a breath breathing pattern because we want to get the most repeatable and accurate measurement of that breath sample. So that's helpful. But the nice thing is it's a simple breath. You, you capture the last part of your breath, put it into the device. It makes a measurement. It shows you a measurement on the device and then it pushes the measurement to your phone, which then you can track and trend. And you can also send that uh, measurement to other, other apps that potentially can integrate that measurement with body fat measurement, exercise, sleep, etc. cetera. Uh, so there's quite a bit of utility with that. The one thing that the reason the device was created initially, and I, for, I forgot to say one reason for measuring ketone bodies is to understand fat loss, right? Yeah. So the idea is you're trying to burn more fat. How do you know every single day you're on that right path? Because most people, myself included, you make a measurement at day one, and then you may make a measurement on the scale day 14. And if your body weight changes, that's success. But probably most of us, body weight doesn't change. And so you, then you look back and you say, well, I've wasted two weeks and I don't know what happened and what caused my failure. That's where the breath acetone measurement can help you say, hey, I'm burning elevated levels of fat every single day. And if you do fall off the wagon, you can catch that almost immediately and make changes to make sure that you continue on that path. So, so the breath acetone, that was the initial reason it was developed. Now there's always obviously some other great reasons why measurement of ketosis and breath acetone can be beneficial that we've talked about, but that's where the level device really fits in. Yeah. And, and, you know, just like you said, there's so much variability in how we respond to different meals, um, stressors in our life, fasting, all of this kind of stuff. And so that's why, you know, it's not just a cookie cutter lifestyle. Um, there's certain unique modifications that need to be made based on, you know, a number of different factors. And so testing really is critical. I have had so many different clients that are like, Hey, I'm following ketogenic diet yet. I'm not losing weight. I'm following ketogenic diet yet. I feel hungry all the time. Um, and so they're getting a lot of these types of reactions that are not really uh, congruent with necessarily following a long-term ketogenic lifestyle. Normally we shouldn't have constant hunger and cravings. Normally we should have, you know, a steady fat loss if we're really following it correctly. And so I always ask them, have you tested your ketones? And typically the answer is no. Typically they're not testing it. They're just kind of following certain guidelines. And, uh, you know, the advantage of being able to test regularly really helps us understand how somebody is responding to different things. And, you know, when it comes to, to blood ketones, because of the cost and the invasiveness, I've always told people test maybe two to three times a day. Um, and there's, you know, advantages of doing that, but like, Hey, if we can do something where we're able to test first thing in the morning, uh, before our first meal, you know, directly after the, after the first meal, maybe an hour afterwards, it's going to help us understand how the body's responding to that particular meal, the foods that are in there. Um, you know, in a sense, almost like the cortisol awakening response in the morning. 
um, if they're overshooting cortisol, increasing blood sugar. So there's so many different factors that, um, that could be negating results that they're looking for and blocking, inhibiting their body's ability to produce adequate amount of ketones to get the, the desired effect that are hard to figure out without consistent testing. And so, um, you know, being able to test with something accurate through like breath ketones on a consistent basis, multiple times and five, 10, 15 times throughout the day, I see that as uh, really helping fill in the gap to, to figure these things out. And so why is um, calibration? Because I know with the level, uh, with the level device, there's just a, a consistent approach towards calibration. Why is that so important when we're doing breath acetone testing? Yeah, the accuracy and the calibrate the accuracy comes from the calibration, um, and I'll and definitely want to talk about that. But let me let me go back to what you said because you said a lot of a lot of things with the measurement, which I think are really important, and they really are what adds a lot of value from the level device. For example, you, the idea of making multiple measurements throughout the day is fantastic because you may find um, as a user you may find that, hey, there's something I'm doing during the day and I'm forgetting I'm doing. For example, what we found which is not uncommon, people kind of unconsciously eat sometimes. Sometimes they go and they have that drawer of candy that they just kind of pull something from. They don't even think about it and they eat it, which obviously kills their, their ketogenic diet. It kills their, their weight loss program, et cetera. And that's something, if you're making those multiple measurements, you can kind of capture that because as people, sometimes we lie to ourselves and so, so that can be good. The, the good, good way to kind of track and find out, yeah. you know, I am messing up at nighttime, rewarding myself with the, piece of chocolate cake every night because I've done a good job throughout the day right. really is killing my diet. So that's one thing. The second, it keeps us honest. The second thing is because the data gets pushed to uh, a larger database, you, uh, Dr. Jockers, as a coach can actually look at your clients mm -hmm. and help them along to say, Hey, you know what? There's, there's this time on Thursday that you're having problems. Let's talk about that. And let's use every, we like to say every re reading is a good reading, whether it's high or low. And so it allows you to say, hey, let's talk about that. Let's have a good conversation. And maybe there's something I can do for you and have ways to, to navigate those tough situations, whether it be stress or the, the attempt to eat things that you shouldn't be eating or not sleeping, et cetera. And then the final thing I think is fantastic with lots of measurements is you understand your own body. I mean, that's really what this biomarker is all about is it's internal. It lets you know how your genetics, which is, which is forming your machinery to burn fats and all sorts of other um, chemicals allows those to be transitioned so you can understand your machinery by making these measurements and that's really one of the most powerful things and and then to go to your question is how do you know that measurement is accurate and reliable well and the way you do that with any measurement really is and in levels no different is to calibrate the measurement and so we have these canisters that have known concentrations of acetone in them that we put across the device to make sure that, that our level device is measuring two parts per million, four parts per million with great accuracy. So that then when you put your unknown sample, which is coming from your breath, it simply has to make a comparison to those known concentrations. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so important to get that consistency and that accuracy. And, you know, I mean, we could talk all day just about the importance of really going back to the other question, the variability, because I will see so many people with different food sensitivities. For example, eggs are a great ketogenic food but I've seen a lot of people with food sensitivities to eggs. And so they were eating eggs and it was actually causing a stress response in their body, which increased their blood glucose and insulin levels, which blocked their body's ability to burn fat and produce ketones. And so they, you know, it's hard to figure that out on your own, but if you are eating a meal with eggs, normally that should keep you in, or help promote a fat burning state in your body. As long as, you know, if it's a low carb meal, um, like just for example, just some scrambled eggs or hard boiled eggs or something like that. It's kind of the kind of meal that's going to promote fat burning and ketone production. However, um, if you're not getting those results with it, if you're testing an hour, two, three hours after, um, and you're not getting the results, it's a sign that for whatever reason, your body had a stress response uh, blood sugar went up, you're not burning the fat that, that you're supposed to. And if you've got specific weight loss goals, um, also you'll be able to see actually how well you're burning fat. And again, we need, we need a, a system because there are other um, breath analyzers out there and, and I've used them and, and other people have as well. And what I found was very inconsistent results that I was getting. And so with the level, it really intrigued me because of 
just the, um, the major effort towards accuracy and uh, the, the, the consistent calibration to make sure that whatever you were breathing into the meter was actually the result that you were getting. Yeah, that's, exa that's exactly it. You hit on multiple topics, and one of them really goes to the point of everybody is different. And the, th the guidelines we have, which are great guidelines for the population as a whole, may or may not work for the individual. And most likely, they're not, they're not all going to work for any individual. But it's a good baseline to start from. But then you've got to kind of, like you said, eggs seem like a great place to start for burning fat. As a matter of fact, I eat them all the time. Yeah. But they may not be the best. They may be the best for everyone, like you said, because you may have an allergy. Or there may, in fact, the other piece is most, some people may put things on those eggs mm. <laughs> that kill their fat metabolism that you wouldn't mm. think for the population would kill fat metabolism. Yeah. But for that individual, you know, adding cheese to the egg may not be what you what needs to happen to have that good effect of fat, fat metabolism. And, like, and then, like you said, is you're, you're right. The, the second piece isn't necessarily the sample, so to speak, and how that sample gets created due to changing your diet exercise. The other piece is the measurement side. And you're right. The calibration is so key for any sort of chemical measurement. And that's why, you know, we spent so much time to make sure that this is an accurate measurement with calibration. You know, with time, we'd like to, move away from having to do the calibration at all but that may not happen because the measurements we're doing are such low values we're, we're talking one molecule of acetone in a million molecules which is a really very fine and sensitive measurement so uh, in some sense calibration has to be done because it's such a fine measurement yeah and I, I obviously the calibration is one of the most important distinguishing factors between the level and other breath breath acetone uh meters so what, what are some of the other distinguishing factors? Yeah, the other things that we've really focused on are getting a great sample, right? Yeah. And, and that's one of the things where I, my background comes in very well is to have people taking a deeper breath, mm -hmm. um, hold their breath for a period of time, about five seconds. It allows the acetone to equilibrate to get uh, well mixed in the lungs and then provide a very comfortable large exhalation. Now, all these, all these pieces, inhalation, breath hold, exhalation, they should all be comfortable. They should be something you can do every single time you provide a breath sample. You don't have to take in a huge breath, hold it in a huge exhalation. That's not what we're trying to do here. It's just something that's comfortable, that's repeatable, et cetera. And the reason that's effective is what we've shown is the repeatability breath to breath is you know a tenth of a parts per million. So 0.1 part per million difference in the re repeat measurements from breath, from breath to breath from, from our data. So that's an important one is the comfortable breath sample that can be repeated. The other one we found, accuracy, is obviously very important. And then the ability to track and trend these values, not only on your, your device, but also pairing it with other platforms out there that can allow you to integrate information. We have the ability on ours to add your weight and your body fat mass, but there's other things people want to integrate. And then I think the last thing as well is, like I said earlier, is once that data is on the web, the coach can access it and view all their clients and say, you know what, Betsy had a tough day on Thursday and I've been seeing that happen. I needed to contact her and Joanne's doing a great time the entire time. But Sam, you know what, he's, he's not even close, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got to have a good conversation on how we get him started up and get him moving towards where he needs to be. So all those pieces from accuracy to ease of measurement to, to, um, tracking and training to use by the coach, I think are all things that really provide a lot of value with the mobile device. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, definitely uh, important things because again, you know, the goal here is it's a biofeedback device. And I've found clinically working with, pa with patients, I mean, the most important thing is getting that proper biofeedback on a regular basis helps that individual really understand how to master their body and really the health journey in general. And we're trying to accomplish health goals I tell people it's like getting a master's degree in your own health. I mean, you're going to invest time, money, and energy into doing it. And you have to look at it like that. It's not, you know, you're not a pill away. You're not a week of dieting away. Instead, it's a lifestyle approach. And the goal is to learn as much as possible about your own body and your own unique traits and characteristics and how you respond to certain stressors and foods and uh, biofeedback devices such as the level are extremely helpful. So um, with that, I know we've been talking about the level, and uh, I'd love to see a, a demonstration of this. I'm sure our audience would as well. So uh, I know you've got one there, right there with yeah. you. Uh, yeah, so 
so here's the uh let's see if i can put it up here here's the level device yeah um it's about the size of a kleenex box in some sense yeah. inside of it you've got uh two breath ports mm -hmm. so this one's one that just kind of uses for storage this is the one that you're going to put your the breath pot in when you're ready to make the measurement um and then essentially i'll even do a measurement here we've got yeah. user one hopefully you can see that it says user yeah, two <laughs> and then guest guest mode so you can have multiple different users and guests but here's the breath pod i'll take that out um and basically the breath pod just allows it's just that you can open it up and uh just empty inside mm -hmm. <laughs> it's going to just simply capture the air coming out of your mouth um i am i'll put in a mouthpiece because if you use it with in your home you may want to have a mouthpiece or if you use it at a gym or something but we have two breath pods that come with the device so like i said we also have an app let me just make sure i'm paired here so the two breath pods one of them is they're both calibrated and one of them saying okay this is kind of standard and then you're breathing in to kind of to to show the difference in a sense yeah we we do the calibration before you even use just mm -hmm. the simple breath pod and once the calibration is done, then it's ready for you to, to, to put a breath sample in. Yeah. And ready to go. So let me do that. Deeper breath in, hold it for five seconds, then a big comfortable exhalation, then we'll put it into the device here. Let me just make sure we're ready to go. Okay. And then simply put this into the device there, and we're going to close the lid. And you can see it's starting... Yep. the measurement so what that's doing is simply pulling the breath across the sensor and making the measurement of acetone it takes about 20 seconds so i'll put that down um i don't imagine my breath of acetone concentration will be very large today and it's not so you can see it says one there on the level device and if i show you the app yep. so i don't know if that if Your you can read that it's 0. 0.9 which yep. is about one mm -hmm. you can see old measurements of mine right here across the bottom so other measurements i've made and then as we scroll up it tracks and trends different measurements below i haven't made a lot of measurements recently because i've been kind of out of town yeah but uh but that kind of gives you the whole reading there and then from the the app it gets sent out to the cloud and like i said it can show up on a if the user gives gives your coach um access the coach can look at a a dashboard and see all their clients and see that measurement. Yeah, so this is really helpful for nutritionists, dietitians, anybody that's looking to be a keto coach, personal trainers, uh, doctors like myself, because again, we're able to track it. It's something that, you know, that individual, if, if the client has it right in their house, they can be doing it throughout the day. And the keto coach can take a look at it every day, every other day, every once a week, once every two weeks, you know, as often as, as needed to kind of track what's going on. And especially if that person's got, you know, some sort of a journal going with it, like a, like a meal plan journal where they're writing about that or stress levels in their, in their life um, and kind of tailoring the results on the level, the breath acetone levels, along with, you know, the, the nutrition and lifestyle trends. So yeah, really cool. That's, that's exactly it. And, and it gives you another touch point with your clients. We don't have to have face to face time, but you do have the ability remotely to interact with them. And make sure they know you know you're interested in what's going on you really want to help promote their lifestyle that's why you guys are in this business there's no doubt about it that's why we all are um without having to take up a lot of time but keep them keep those nudges happening to make sure they continue on that right path yeah yeah absolutely i see it as an extremely helpful tool um how let's talk about the breath acetone spectrum i know we had a conversation about that last week and i was excited to to really learn more in this interview about what you're doing with the research with the, the breath acetone spectrum. Yeah. And it, it kind of leads naturally from where we're at too, because yeah. one of the things you said is how can you elevate breath acetone or what foods, what diets, what stressors, sleep, all those things, what's causing the, what, what are the best ways to elevate breath acetone and essentially elevate fat metabolism. So mm -hmm. what we've done is, uh, I put together through the literature what values of breath acetone you'd see based on different kind of large scale events. And that one of the reasons that was a driver was a lot of physicians, when you talk to them about, hey, we're going to, we have a device that measures acetone and breath. They, they have this frown and they say, why would you ever want to do that? Someone has acetone in their breath. They should be going to the emergency room because that means they're in diabetic ketoacidosis, which 
macho. A lot of people understand, some may not. But the reality is, is, is in fact, there's, there's a big spectrum, there's a big range of acetone and breath that you can get to before you ever get to that edge of saying, oh, you know what, you're in a condition where you probably need to go to the, to the ER. And so that's what we did with this publication. Everyone has about one to two parts per million of acetone in their breath. doesn't matter what diet they're on. Um, that's where you'd expect someone to be. And you just saw as 0.9 parts per million, which is not surprising uh, for me. But as you start to transition into an elevated state of fat metabolism, that just may be, hey, I'm going to eat, still eat a standard American diet. It's going to be mixed of carbohydrates, proteins, fats. Um, but I'm going to cut back my calories a little bit, calorie restriction. Then you could see somewhere between uh, 2 and 10 parts per million elevation. And really what that's associated with, it can be tracked with fat loss. And that was one of the reasons we were excited about the level devices. There's a nice study um, back in the early 90s that's showing the actual the, the level of acetone in your breath, let's say it's two parts per million, is correlated with a half pound of fat mass loss per week. So for folks who just want to do calorie restriction, that two to 10 parts per million can be a great range to be in to, to help you understand, am I on the right path to lose fat mass? Okay, so that's that range. The next range is really from 10 to 100, and you find that in folks who are fasting. So they've, you know, it can be intermittent fasting, it can be a three-day, a seven-day fast. They've cut down, cut down all foods from their, from intake. The other side of that coin can be someone who's removed all sugars. So you're on a ketogenic diet, you're eating higher fats, maybe a little bit. Of, you're going to eat some protein. You can get in that 10 to 100 parts per million of acetone by um, elevating uh, your fat metabolism through ketogenic diet. And then when you really start to see this um, diabetic ketoacidosis, I would say it's somewhere between 300 and 1,250 parts per million. So you're talking 100 fold higher than where you're at if you're just simply eating a standard American diet, a really different range. And obviously it's not the acetone that's causing the debilitating effects. It's the underlying diabetic condition that's causing acidosis in the blood. It's kind of causing some metabolic disturbances that are then perpetuating themselves into this expression of acetone in the exhaled breath. But the underlying condition is what's really causing the problem. It's not the acetone per se. Uh, so those are kind of the different places you can be. The other one I'll, I'll mention, haven't talked about it yet, is the exogenous ketones, right? Or the medium chain triglyceride ingestion. Yeah. And those are probably going to force your body into that 10 to 100 parts per million acetone range too. But those are going to be maybe short-lived depending on how often you eat the medium chain triglycerides and the exogenous ketones. Yeah, cool. Really, really cool stuff. And um, let's talk about how the level can take the breath acetone levels of parts per million and then convert that into fat, fat loss and fat burned in a sense. Right. And that's what, go back to that paper. Um, so first thing I'll say is one of the things we've done is published a, a review paper on breath acetone and fat metabolism. And that you can find on the Level Now website. Uh, I, I know you have a copy too, Dr. Jocker, so I'm sure you'd be happy to share that. But what it does is kind of talks through all the different science that's gone on in the last 50 years. And this is one of the publications by a gentleman named, named Kundu. He was a scientist out of the Abbott Laboratories in the early 90s. And they did a nice study with about 80 to 100 subjects showing that folks who are on calorie-restricted diets, if they are losing fat mass, their acetone levels go up in proportion to the amount of fat loss per week. So like I said, a two part per million, which is just a mild elevation in breath acetone. And when I say mild, even though I say mild, doesn't mean it, it's not somewhat difficult to get to as, as folks will understand. But if you can get to two parts per million on a calorie restricted mixed diet, you're expected to lose about a half pound of fat mass per week. If you get to four parts per million, it's about a one pound of fat mass. And when I mean pound, I mean, actually pounds of fat, not pounds of body mass. So you may lose more body mass, which is pretty typical because the water starts to come off yeah. when you get rid of the sugars. So that's where this correlation between the two happens. And it's really around this calorie restriction mm. uh, phase of, of that. Yeah. And, that, and that's important too, because when people start on a ketogenic lifestyle, oftentimes, especially people that are overweight, are obese, that need to lose weight quickly, they do lose weight quickly but a lot of it's water weight and then they hit a certain plateau. Yeah. And then this can really help us understand what's happening there with the plateau because again, that initial weight loss oftentimes is the water weight. Yeah, that's exactly it. So the water weight's lost and they get pretty excited that things are moving yeah. forward as I'd expect. And then like you said, you get to that plateau and that's where really I think the level device is even more effective because then it allows you to say, okay, now let's 
kind of um, experiment in a sense. Let's change some of your dietary conditions. So we put you on like we said, eggs and bacon, well, maybe let's move it to avocados or maybe let's add mm -hmm. the medium chain triglyceride supplement for this. Or maybe there's something else that works in your practice that you've had success with. And then maybe let's add an extra hour of sleep. Let's try to cut out some of the stress mm -hmm. that's causing, you know, the increase in cortisols, not allowing your body to increase the fat metabolism. So all those things then as you as a coach, really, that's where the coaching comes in. It can be really effective. Yeah, and I find that to be extremely effective because, I mean, as a functional medicine doctor myself, you know, I run labs on different people and labs are great and they give us kind of like a one-time reading of what's happening. Like if we're looking at adrenals, if we're looking at thyroid, um, inflammatory levels, we're seeing what's happening kind of right now in the moment in, you know, with those, those bodily systems. You know, the cool thing about this is we're able to see, you know, what's happening this week, what's happening next week, what's happening throughout the day, what's happening just on a continuous basis as far as this individual's physiology and their metabolism. So, you know, I find that super helpful. Yeah, that's, you hit the, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I, I don't feel, and I'm not a clinician, but I don't feel any clinician really wants to make a medical decision off of one data point, right? Yeah. And that's, I think what you hit on is you do that blood draw, you get a data point and you get this nice blood blood profile, but do you want to make any major changes off of one data point that may or may not be representative of the individual as a whole? That's why this series, time series of data points, you can start to feel a little more comfortable, at least in my opinion, to say, okay, well, let's make some changes and they don't have to be huge changes, but you have the ability to lots of data mm -hmm. that you can then start to analyze and say, okay, this is working that's not working and let's keep moving you along a path where that single data point is a tough one to really get a gauge on the individual as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as we're talking here, I, I mean, I can see the functional use of this for nutritionists, health coaches, you know, as a ketogenic diet, so one of the reasons why we're doing this summit is to really get this message out. And, um, you know, there's a lot of nutritionists, dietitians that are listening to this, personal trainers, health coaches, a lot of doctors that are listening, but also a lot of lay people that are just interested in the ketogenic lifestyle and how it can benefit them in their lives. And so I know with Level, there's multiple different programs. People can certainly purchase it and have it at their house. Um, you know, different practitioners can use that in their practices. Um, and so tell us more about like how that works, um, the cost of the, the system, and, um, you know, and, and, and let's compare that to other ways of, of testing ketones as well. Yeah, you know, the one thing I, I want to bring up first before I talk about yeah. The details of it, is, and we forgot to say this, is the folks in the company at level, a lot of us came out of medical device industry or mm -hmm. have had experience with that. So one of the things that we found about of value is to make this listed with the Food and Drug Administration here in the U.S. So mm -hmm. it's an FDA class one registered or listed device. And we find great pride in that because it is a medical grade device in that sense. And so yeah. some of this, as a result, there are some costs associated with you know making making it so. Two different offerings for the device. One is a home and one is a professional. And what I mean by the professional is you as a coach can have in your office or um, gym, et cetera. Clients can come in, make measurements on that, whether you're there or not. And like I said, the data then gets shared with you and you can see it, et cetera. But that allows the user to kind of bundle in that cost with the cost of your services. And you can provide, it's, it's in some sense, people have been able to use it as a business model as well. But it does provide a little more access to the individual. The home device is $699 for the device, $699. And then there's a $50 per month fee that covers the sensors as well as those calibration canisters to keep the device accurate in measurement. Um, the professional device, there's a higher monthly fee just to do the on, ongoing um, access with, with the uh, with the back end, with the, the management of the digital data. So those are the kind of the two different offerings we have. Obviously, they come with all their tech support uh, and the other things uh, with the calibration, the sensor, and that sort of thing. So we find great value in that. And the reason is when you look at the alternative, with it, which is blood, the blood strips are about three, four bucks uh, a measurement. And then you, you figure out how many measurements you want to do a month. That's going to be pretty costly per month if you want to get that many measurements. The other nice thing for the level device, as I've said multiple times, is the non-invasiveness, the tracking and trending, and the interaction with your coaching that really isn't as easily provided with that blood measurement as well. Yeah, and also, I mean, the FDA, just getting that certified by the FDA, I'm sure, had a, had a lot of costs because 
they obviously are going to do all the checks and balances just to make sure that that, that system is working and uh, as it says it is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The FDA, FDA is a huge piece for us. And obviously, because if we want to go in, which we are moving towards some of those medical therapies using the ketogenic diet, um, having that FDA backing is really critical for us to make sure that we're following all the rules that need to be followed. Yeah, for sure. And so, you know, going back to the idea of different ways of testing ketones, you've got urine testing, which is the most common. It's the most common way people get started, but ultimately it's really not effective um, because again, we're not actually testing how the body's using ketones. So really the only two effective approaches are going to be blood ketones and breath acetone levels. And so we know with blood ketones, number one, it's invasive. I know for myself and I, you know, there's a, there's a percentage of people listening that, that can relate to this. I freak out every time and I'm trying to minimize unnecessary stress. So, uh, you know, <laughs> But I don't test blood ketones anymore because of that. Um, also, I've seen people with like big calluses, you know, because they're constantly testing um, and it just kind of damages their fingers. And, you know, it's just, um, it, it's not, I don't think it's very sustainable. It can definitely be beneficial for a period of time, but the sustainability of that uh, is, is definitely a lot less. And of course, like you said, you know, the cost at this point for blood ketones, I mean, you know, if you're doing this on a regular basis, several times a day, I mean, you're, you're, you're paying just as much after a month or two, you know, um, as you would with the, uh, with the level. And then of course you've got breath acetone levels and uh, there are devices out there that um, I've had experience with, and I just haven't seen the accuracy be where I wanted it. Um, and just very inconsistent readings that I was getting frustrated with. And so I searched yeah. on the internet and I found the level and I, and I saw some videos of you guys just really talking about the calibrations and um, just kind of this really this focus on clinical accuracy. And that really intrigued me. And that's why uh, I pursued you guys and I start, got a level for myself and started using this. And that's exactly what I've seen as well. Um, there is a calibration kind of process that can be a little tedious that goes into it. But, um, you know, it's kind of like riding a bike or something like that. You kind of get used to it. Uh, after a while, somebody that's not techie like myself, it took me a little bit. Um, I was on the phone with the support, so the su having the support help is good. Although you guys do make it easy with videos and whatnot. Um, you know, watch some couple of few minute videos and it kind of shows you how to do it all. Um, and then, you know, you just get used to the, the constant calibration and, you know, the results are, are just continuously accurate so you can, you can put your trust in that. Yeah, and you and you brought up a couple things. You know, you noticed I didn't talk about um, urine. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I usually don't talk about urine because it really isn't a good way to make a measurement. No, like you said, it's a good way to get started. Yeah, I, I definitely give you that. But because of the multiple issues with the accuracy of the measurement and how to interpret it, in fact, the other one I forgot to say is what you're measuring acetoacetate in the urine. One of the things I talked about from the very beginning is remember acetoacetate converts into acetone. Yeah. So all the acetoacetate in your bladder and the urine, some of that gets converted to acetone, which lowers the concentration that you ultimately measure. So that's another, another issue, but I, I, you know, I don't, that's why I don't belabor it because it's kind of a nice way to get introduced, but it really isn't a long-term solution by any means because it doesn't give you any really qualitative. Yeah or quantitative data, it's all qualitative. All it tells us is your body's producing ketones, but there's a difference between producing them and using them. You can produce them, but the reality is if your body doesn't have the metabolic machinery built in order to actually utilize them for, for energy and for fuel, then um, you're not getting the results. And so uh, so it's, it's not a good measurement. I tell people, hey, you know what, ultimately, that's not gonna help us. Um, I wouldn't waste your money on, on urine strips. If you're gonna test, do blood or do uh, breath acetone levels. That's what you're looking at there. And again, as, as somebody who runs lab tests, I mean, it's pretty easy you know, for people to spend six, seven, eight hundred dollars $800, a lot for you know, uh, three tests, it can be $1,000 um, just on lab testing and doing that every three months or so, um, three to six months while they're going through their health journey is very common in the functional medicine world. And so if you were to minimize like one of those lab tests and uh, you know, get, get something like a level right there, I mean, that just drops your, your overall lab testing cost and your overall, I guess you could say, um, you know, your, toss of me your, your cost of measuring your health status uh, to, to make tweaks in your, your lifestyle to get the goals that you want, it, it reduces that overall cost. 
and it gives you something that gives you continuous feedback. So I see great benefit in that. And this is really a new company. And so it's just, you guys just started in what, 2016, 2017, and just are now introducing it to the market? Yeah, we've been, we've been around for a while, but the market, we just introduced it to the market last year, right? Yeah. So in terms of our market rollout was last year and uh, it's, it's taken uh, five to seven years to get it to this point where we could actually put it out in the marketplace because there's a lot of development that went on. But like you said, I think a couple pieces of the cost, we do have some other cost structures in terms of breaking that upfront cost out into monthly payments. So that's yeah. something to take a look at as well on a website. Yeah. And then the other thing I wanted to talk about, like you said, the breadth and the blood measurements really are kind of the key ones now. And the breath does align with blood, and that's something we showed oh, yeah. in this publication. We're yeah. gathering some more data as we even talk to show that breath levels of breath acetone are correlated in, in a loose sense with blood beta hydroxybutyrate. And kind of one of the markers I give folks based off of our data, our internal data, is it appears the level data, if you have somewhere between eight and 10 parts per million your blood beta hydroxybutyrate should be around 0.5 millimolar or greater. And that's obviously I'm giving you some numbers so the folks who are kind of understand what these numbers mean are probably more valuable than, than folks who are just getting initiated to it. But that nutritional ketosis level that's usually defined by that 0.5 millimolar beta hydroxybutyrate is typically seen from what our data starts to show between eight and 10 parts per million of breath acetone. A little bit different than what you see in the, in the literature. We published that. Literature shows a little bit different relationship, but there is a, there's a nice relationship between the two. Yeah, so we found that the level is basic. Well, in general, uh, nutritional ketosis basically starts at 0.5 uh, millimole per liter of beta hydroxybutyrate. And your typical nutritional ketosis range is going to be between that and 3.0, uh, depending on you know what what sort of uh, condition we're trying to treat. Sometimes with cancer, we'll get it up higher, but that's kind of typically the range that people are going to be in unless they are doing prolonged fasting. Um, when it comes to blood beta hydroxybutyrate levels, and so when we look at that, we we track it on. Uh, breath acetone levels, you're saying roughly at 8 to 10 part per million breath acetone level is equivalent to 0 0.5 uh, blood or beta hydroxybutyrate blood uh, ketones. And so um, that's basically about the measurement. And then you guys are doing more research with that. And uh, eventually the goal is to have, you know, have all of that put together. And so it's, it's uh, more concise as far as where the measurements are, like 30 parts per million would, would be equivalent to roughly, let's say 3.0 uh, um, millimole per liter. Yep. So that's what you guys are looking to do. Yeah, that's exactly it. So we're still gathering more data and, and, you know, obviously that relationship may, adjust but what the data we have currently uh seems to indicate that sort of relationship for that nutritional ketosis cutoff and that's important for example the diabetic keto acid, the, the reversal type 2 diabetes typically yeah. folks like to get you to a 0.5 nutritional 0.5 millimolar beta hydroxybutyrate to make sure that you're in the zone that we can start to move folks off of insulin or the other metformin etc to yeah. try to get them back on the uh, right path. So yeah, that's a, that's a, a nice cutoff. Well, this is cool stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm really glad that you're the chief scientific advisor for level because all, you do research. That's what you do. And that's, yeah. um, what you're doing, you know, in your full-time job is research and constantly analyzing to make, you know, to come up with graphs and to make the ketogenic lifestyle easier for everybody else. Uh, I, think, um, you know, I just want to, uh, you know, to, to really, uh, acknowledge you for that, for really being on the, on the cutting edge and being on the forefront of moving this revolution, this ketogenic revolution forward, because ultimately, I mean, again, we talked about the, the drawbacks of testing with blood ketones and, um, you know, the more that we can create an easier, simpler process for testing and measuring ketones and fat burning state, the, the, the better results people are going to get, more consistent results people are going to get. We're going to have less of, uh, you know, less of the critics that are saying, hey, you know, I tried a ketogenic lifestyle and this, and I had a bad response or whatever it was because they're going to be able to test and uh, also making it a lot easier for coaching, uh, for coaches like myself to really be able to work with clients and get the results. So really, yeah, it's, it's interesting. You, you, br you brought up the thing of this new revolution in, in science in a sense. 
And it is true. We're, we're starting a new phase. There's been a lot of literature out there in some sense, but there's not really been consistent literature on, uh, on forming scientific hypotheses and, and understanding is it, are they true or not? And what I mean by that, for example, there, if you look through the literature, there's been quite a few different studies that say, you know, the high fat, low sugar diet isn't good. High fat, low sugar diet is good. And when you look in there, you see how they define their macronutrient yeah. combination. And then there's no measurements of how high these folks got in terms of their level of ketosis or fat metabolism. It's just more of a very simple observational study. And so that makes it difficult. You get mixed messages as a lay person, even as a clinician, you don't have a lot of time to go through all the science. So having measurements and having really more foundational um, understanding of it allows you to move science forward. Whereas before, if it's just observational and people are calling a duck, you know, they're calling a parrot a duck and they're calling a, a, an eagle a duck. It's hard to make these comparisons. And that's where the measurements really are coming in handy to allow science to move forward on this. And I'm, I'm excited about it because there's so much new learning that's going on with the new science that's coming out. And it's, and it's when you integrate it with the stuff we've learned from fasting, there's a couple of different groups that did some amazing work on fasting and measuring ketone bodies in the fasting state and starting to integrate the, the new, the new science that we've, come into those studies, uh, you really get some rich understanding that's going to help benefit the ketogenic lifestyle. Yeah, really cool stuff. And uh, Dr. Anderson, when, where do we find out more about the level? If somebody wants to purchase a level, uh, find out more information, uh, tell us how, how we can find out that out. Sure. You can go to levelnow, L-E-V-L-N-O-W.com, levelnow.com yeah. uh, is, is the website that you can buy the device there. You can also learn a lot about what the device does, um, some of the idea of why you'd want to elevate into ketosis. So there's a lot of information there. You can also go to Amazon. We have it for sale there on the Amazon marketplace. Um, and then different partners have uh, the ability to, we sell through some different partners as well, but, but basically levelnow.com or Amazon marketplace. Sounds great. And they'll also be able to stay up to date with things that you're doing as well. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of the science that we have is on there. Um, we have some videos that talk about the stuff we've talked about today. Uh, we have a couple of the papers we're trying to scientific publications we're trying to put out here in the next uh, calendar year. And so, yeah, we're excited about where this is going and, and really want to move um, our understanding of fat metabolism forward with the level device. Well, this is just great, you know, uh, to, to really on this ketogenic revolution in, in general, I mean, we need, more scientists, more researchers out there doing this work. And so I just really appreciate you doing that. And, uh, you know, it's another great thing that for me, I, I just feel, um, you know, really excited to be, you know, working with you guys with Level. I've got a Level device myself that I work with with clients. And, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, you guys are, are one of our sponsors here for the Keto Edge Summit. And I feel excited about it because I know that, you know, investing into you guys is really helping propel this whole movement forward because you, of the research that you guys are putting out and that just the focus on clinical accuracy. So, um, so again, thank you for being on and thank you for the great work. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And, uh, yeah, this is a lot of fun. I hope people find some great benefit in this and, and check out the level now website and, uh, see what we can do for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you've enjoyed this interview and some of the other interviews in our Keto Edge Summit, then I want to encourage you, the listener, to consider owning the entire summit for yourself. That way you get access to all 32 of our interviews with experts. You get the transcripts, you get all the bonus materials, everything you need to really put the ketogenic lifestyle to work. And so if you consider looking at that and owning this for yourself, then we would really be honored and we will see you on a future interview.